I first want to thank Dorsetta for putting together this amazing gathering and especially for inviting me to it. I, I second need to point out that I am currently the president of the foundation. Foundations cannot touch politics with a long stick. So I have taken formally a day of vacation to be here because I would like to embrace politics this morning <laughs> rather forthrightly. Yeah. Um, and finally, mostly, I like to get up and just talk, uh, generally waving my arms and screaming. This is, this is one of the more important talks I'm going to be giving in the next year. And I'm going to be dealing with some fairly delicate topics, some topics on which there's some misunderstanding. I'm going to be trying to do it really, really rapidly. So that means that for some stories that probably some of you have written term papers on, Dorsetta may well have written a book on, I will cover in a sentence or a paragraph. I wanted to make it as well as possible, so I've got much more extensive notes than usual. I plan to quickly touch on the antebellum South, the Civil Rights Act, Richard Nixon's election, Earth Day, and some of the things that we can learn from the resulting underappreciated and deeply flawed, but nonetheless rather sweeping environmental revolution. And I mean revolution, not in the sense of a revolutionary laundry detergent, but something actually more akin to the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the digital revolution, uh, in, in terms of its scope and impact. Um, and I'm then going to wrap up quickly with my views on where we can go from here. Following Reconstruction, the solidly democratic South overthrew every racial accomplishment of the Civil War, except slavery. By the end of the 19th century, our South had embraced a style of all-encompassing racial segregation, right down to the drinking water fountains, that was explicitly adopted by South Africa as its model for apartheid 50 years later. African Americans had terrible schools, terrible pay, terrible living conditions, no right to vote. The South also captured the chairmanships of every crucial congressional committee for nearly a century, and that's why the original New Deal, which was at its core a progressive collection of initiatives, also institutionalized racism across the entire country. That's what it took for Roosevelt to get it through the Southern Committee chairs. So, I've already advanced to the middle of the 20th century. The setting is Alabama, 1956, a then obscure 26-year-old African-American minister named Martin Luther King is helping to spearhead a boycott against segregated buses in Montgomery. King's home has just been destroyed by a firebomb, and it's almost miraculous that his wife and all of his children managed to escape. And that very same night, a rally billed as the largest pro-segregation rally in history is being held at the Montgomery Coliseum. The keynote speaker is a visiting United States Senator. I am not going to quote him. The words are simply too ugly, too outrageously racist to utter. If any of you really want to clean the stuff out of your arteries, you can actually read it at length in volume four of Robert Caro's biography of Lyndon Johnson. For our purposes, it's enough to say that the speech was so crude, so racist, so violent, that it might have shocked a Nazi rally in Munich in the 1930s. The orator was a guy named James Eastland, visiting senator from Mississippi. Eastland was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the committee that he ruled with an iron fist had to approve all legislation affecting civil rights, affecting voting rights, as well as all federal judicial appointments, including any successors to the Supreme Court a Supreme Court that had just uh, a couple of years earlier passed, ruled unanimously on Board v. Uh, Board of Education, Brown v. Board of Education. Eastland was one of 19 Southern Senators who vowed at that point that, that they would defy the Supreme Court. That's the head of the Judiciary Committee. Hedging toward the 1960s, Southern Democrats had delivered their electoral votes in every election for the National Democratic ticket, and their leaders felt that they had earned the right to have one of their own as the head of the ticket. Their candidate for president in 1960 was Lyndon Johnson. They'd been grooming him for decades. 
To the South's astonishment, Johnson, who was the masterful Senate Majority Leader, he was backed strongly by Richard Russell, the Dean of the Senate, by Sam Rayburn, the Speaker, longtime Speaker of the House of Representatives. If you visit Washington, D.C., two of the five federal buildings housing Congress are the Russell Building and the Rayburn Building. Um, Johnson was defeated for the presidential nomination by a junior senator from Massachusetts. John Kennedy was dismissed by most of his Senate colleagues as a rich, callow playboy, a political lightweight. Johnson was grudgingly offered the vice presidency as a consolation prize. Meanwhile, the civil rights movement was building strength with the strategy of passive civil disobedience. If, if a lunch counter would not serve black patrons, they would go and simply sit at that lunch counter, filling all of the seats until they were served, or until the lunch counter was closed, or until they were attacked. And the attacks came with axe handles, police dogs, fire hoses, bombings, shootings, lynchings. This had been going on for a century. What was new was television. The ugliness of all of that was brought into middle-class living rooms across the nation, and the civil rights movement with its passive civil disobedience, but its quiet moral authority deeply moved millions and millions of Americans. And these included President Kennedy, who despite his lackluster record on race relations when he was in Congress, began speaking out with increasing force. And then on November 22, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. When Lyndon Johnson moved into the White House, his former Southern colleagues were confident that as president, he would be quote unquote reliable on the race issue. He would distance himself from the Kennedy rhetoric. And they were wrong. Lyndon Johnson had a long stifled passion for social justice that was rooted in his very early work as a school teacher in the Texas Hill Country and nurtured when he was working on behalf of the New Deal. With the conscience of the Northeast, the Midwest, the Northwest, the Southwest awakened by civil rights movement in the South and the brutal racist backlash that it had provoked, Johnson played Congress like a conductor leads a huge complex orchestra. Less than one decade after Senator Eastland's racist speech to that rally in Montgomery, standing on the shoulders of civil rights leaders and of thousands of awesomely courageous grassroots activists, Johnson manipulated the Civil Rights Act past the Southern Congressional leadership and into law. He signed the Civil Rights Act on July 2nd, 1964. Later that same month, Barry Goldwater, one of six Republican senators who had voted against the legislation, won the Republican Party's nomination for president. In a very clear foreshadowing of my next little story, of the 52 total electoral votes that Goldwater won, five came from his home state, Arizona. The remainder all came from Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama, all of which had previously been solidly Democratic states. Because of Johnson's coattails, the House Democrats came out of the election with a 155-seat margin, and the new seats were almost entirely filled by freshly elected liberals. In the Senate, the Democrats held a 68 to 32 majority. So it was finally possible in 1965 to pass the Voting Rights Act, giving African American voters real political power with the federal government as enforcement throughout the South. It is impossible to exaggerate the sense of betrayal, the loathing that bigots in the White South felt toward Lyndon Johnson and toward the National Democratic Party. The Johnson presidency, with its promotion of a great society, was the high watermark of American liberalism, the closest that this country has ever come to a true Scandinavian political ethos. But Johnson, as everyone knows, had a fatal flaw. He refused to believe that America, the greatest military power in the history of the world, could be defeated by some little pipsqueak country in Southeast Asia, whose name he never learned to pronounce correctly. Ultimately, the war in Vietnam grew so deeply and widely unpopular that for the sake of national unity, Johnson announced that he would not run for re-election after it became pretty clear he might well lose his own party's primary. Four days after that announcement, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. Riots broke out in cities across the nation. Here in Chicago, 
11 people were killed, more than 2,000 were arrested. A 10 minute drive from this hotel, a vast section of the East Garfield Park community was reduced to rubble. Two months after that, Robert Kennedy, the one candidate who appealed to African Americans, Latinos, and the working class whites, was assassinated in Los Angeles. Chaos reigned. In the 1968 election, Richard Nixon, who a decade earlier had actually had a stronger record on civil rights than had John F. Kennedy, devised a bold, cynical, politically opportunistic Southern strategy designed to flip the South politically to the Republican Party while holding on to traditional Republican strongholds in the Midwest. He won the election in 1968 and took office in 1969. This Southern strategy put the so-called Rockefeller wing of the party, the Northeast and Northwest moderates, up for grabs. So Nelson Rockefeller, Chuck Percy, John Lindsay, Pete McCloskey, Bill Scranton, John Chafee, John Sherman Cooper, Elliot Richardson, George Romney, Ed Brooke, and many, many, many others were torn between parties. They suddenly found that their party did not represent at all their values. Um, Ed Brooke, who is now largely forgotten as someone who should not be forgotten, Ed Brooke was the first African-American senator in American history to be popularly elected. He was also the first African-American ever elected to, to be a state's attorney general, and he was of the party of Lincoln. He was a Republican. So that is the chaotic context within which we began organizing the first Earth Day. And here finally is where I'm going to try to tie these strands together to the actual theme of this conference. I arranged meetings with Reverend Abernathy of the SCLC and Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. They received me graciously. They were very polite. But it was clear that the issues that I was highlighting, lead paint and its effect upon children, freeways slashing through minority neighborhoods, the worst air pollution in the country in black neighborhoods, and so forth, simply were not going to become their priorities, not even low priorities in a nation that was rent by assassinations and by riots, with a new president eager to solidify his new base in the racist South, environmental issues simply did not ignite their passions. We were much more successful with some local groups like Black Survival in St. Louis, freeway fighting groups across the country because you don't build a freeway through Beverly Hills, you build it through South Central, but the only national civil rights organization to deeply engage was the National Welfare Rights Organization. Its executive director, George Wiley, was 50 years ahead of his time in proposing what we would now call the universal basic income. George, who became a, a very close friend and a trusted advisor, interestingly had a PhD in organic chemistry from Cornell. He understood as well as anyone back then the impacts of pollution on minority and poor impacted communities, and tragically, he died extremely young in 1973. Had he not died, I genuinely believe that the entire evolution of the environmental justice movement might have been transformed by that one personality. The 20 million Americans who participated in Earth Day, and at least a handful of Jamaicans who participated in Earth Day, catapulted the environment into a top tier status as a political issue. 20 million was by far the largest planned organization in the history of the country. Throughout that spring, the public consciousness was saturated by events focused on air and water pollution, toxics, oil spills, including in places like Santa Barbara, pesticides, burning rivers, lead paint, the use of Agent Orange in Southeast Asia, killing whales and elephants, trash piling up on every beach and everywhere else, ozone threats, dying Great Lakes, I occasionally encounter a wacko belief that the first Earth Day was all hippies with flowers in their hair, smoking dope and grooving. Um, and in fact, there was a widely broadcast photograph from San Francisco of precisely that, but I think that photograph could have been taken on any other day of the year and been exactly the same. <laughs> but for another look at Earth Day, listen, for example, to Charles Hayes, the African-American vice president of the Amalgamated Meat Cutters, right here in Chicago. Working people, black people, and poor people have known about pollution long before it became so fashionable. 
The steel workers have been living under the belching smokestacks of steel mills for the last 50 years. What we're discovering today is that the winds from South Chicago don't stop polluting when they reach the Loop or even the North Shore. What we are discovering is that when enough of these poisons are thrown into the air by the steel mills, the power plants, the oil refineries, it's not just the workers in the plants or the poor living in the shadow of the plants in which breathe these poisons, it's all of us. The environment in which hundreds of thousands of families exist in inner cities across the country includes the rats that attack their babies, the lead in the peeling paint that poisons their babies, the decrepit housing conditions, the inadequate nutrition, the lack of green space. Our program to protect and reclaim the physical environment must include feeding the hungry, healing the sick, building homes and schools, eradicating racism and discrimination, and finally making the National Welfare Program adequate to lift people forever out of the degradation of poverty. Not to put too fine a point on it, at the very first Earth Day, black leaders were calling for what was effectively the Green New Deal. That was 49 years ago. That fall, seven of a dirty dozen incumbent members of Congress went down to defeat in races where the environment clearly provided the margin of victory. I would say it is really tough to beat an incumbent. Our total budget to take on 12 of them nationwide was less than $50,000, and to defeat seven out of 12 on an environmental issue was just stunning, made more stunning by the fact that the very first one to go down in a primary was the chairman of the House Public Works Committee. If you wanted a new federal building, you wanted anything from the federal government that cost money, it had to go through this guy's committee, and he was defeated on an environmental issue uh, by a guy who went on to become Paul Sarbanes, a senator from Maryland. Um, that, as a consequence, laws that were literally unthinkable in 1969 became unstoppable in 1970. Within just five years of that first Earth Day, we passed a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, an Endangered Species Act, an Occupational Health and Safety Act that was sold to many people in Congress as in-plant pollution, a Marine Mammal Protection Act, a Safe Drinking Water Act, established the EPA. That's, that's an interesting story. Let me divert you just a bit on the EPA. Uh, this, take this with a grain of salt, because the guy that told it to me uh, had an interest in telling it to me, and I had an interest in believing it, but it's a good story. So R R Richard Nixon is sitting in the White House on Earth Day, looks out the windows at the mall. There's hundreds of thousands of people on some environmental thing out in the mall. He turns on his television set, and there is a conglomeration of more than one million people in New York. I mean, I was on the platform in New York part of the day. I climbed up maybe 50 feet in the air, and the people spread out like the ocean. People spread further than you could see over the horizon from 50 feet in the air. And addressing them was the mayor of New York who made much of that possible, a guy named John Lindsay, one of those displaced Republican liberals. He was everything that Nixon wanted to be. He was tall, he was handsome, he was articulate. Uh, and he was a threat. Uh, I mean, this was all just very edgy then. So Nixon's turning to a guy who was in the room with him named John Ehrlichman, who at least those of a certain age will recognize the name domestic policy advisor to the president. So what, what am I going to do about this thing? Nixon, when he was first elected, appointed a guy named Roy Ash, the head of Lytton Industries, then a big conglomerate, to put together a commission on governmental reorganization. The most famous thing that came out of it was the creation of the Office of Management and Budget, which Roy Ash later went on to become the director of. But another one of his recommendations was you, you take all the environmental stuff that's scattered around the government and consolidate it. So Ehrlichman, as he's telling it, says to the president, well, you know, politically you got a really interesting option from, from Roy. That report of his was talking about how you could take air pollution out of health, education, and welfare, water pollution, we're already doing that in the Department of Interior, radiation, that's in the Atomic Energy Commission, pesticides, that's over in the Department of Agriculture. You just Grab all those things together, put them in one place. Hell, you might even save a little bit of money. Call it an environmental protection agency, and you're going to be a player. And according to John Ehrlichman, that is how the decision was made on Earth Day to that year create, by a relatively anti-environmental president, uh, the first environmental protection agency in the world with a presidential executive order. 
Um, going on, uh, created the EPA, banned lead-based paint, banned DDT, banned lead and gasoline, set CAFE mileage standards for automobiles, passed the Toxic Substances Control Act, passed the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, passed the National Forest Management Act, all of this within five years. Something north of $25 trillion has been spent by the public sector and the private sector as a result of laws that were passed in that immediate period. And even today, $25 trillion, that's real money. Uh, you can make an argument that in terms of the economic transformation of America, there is nothing in American history equivalent other than the New Deal. And the New Deal was led by an enormously popular president coming out of the Great Depression. The environmental revolution was led by people like you. It was all from the grassroots up. Like Social Security, the benefits were not exclusively targeted to any one population, but in both cases, poor people gained the most. Who were downwind from the worst air pollution? Who was most likely to catch fish for dinner from local polluted streams? Whose children were most likely to be eating lead-based paint? Whose neighborhoods were filled with freeways with cars spewing lead-filled exhaust? Who was most likely to be sprayed with toxic poisons by crop dusting airplanes? As with Social Security, we won big with our first bill, the Clean Air Act of 1970, and it gives you a little bit of sense of the transformation that had taken place in politics. Despite genuinely passionate opposition from the oil industry, the coal industry, the automobile industry, the automobile industry, on, on one famous day, the leaders, the CEOs of what were then the big four American automobile companies, American Motors has since vanished, went in lockstep to every member of the Senate Public Works Committee and said, if you pass this bill, you will turn America into a third world country. Uh, the electric utility industry, the steel industry, others. The Clean Air Act passed the Senate unanimously. It passed the House of Representatives on a voice vote. When in 1972, Nixon vetoed the Clean Water Act, the Senate voted 52 to 12 to override his veto, and the House voted 247 to 23 to overturn his veto. He never tried to veto another environmental bill while he was there. Just as the Clean Air Act was opposed by a vast swath of the nation's economic interests, serious climate action today is fiercely opposed by the President, by the Republican Party, and by all producers, refiners, and transporters of fossil fuels. But if we do everything right, 2020 can be for climate what 1970 was for other environmental issues. Every recent poll shows that strong majorities believe that climate change is real and that it has a human fingerprint. The lavishly funded multi-year disinformation campaign funded by the fossil fuel industry has been thoroughly discredited. For many decades, every poll has found that large majorities of the public favor a very swift transition to 100% clean, renewable energy resources. As in 1970, young people who will have to live with the future are stirring. The Fridays for Future student strikes mobilized 1.6 million strikers in 125 nations on March 15th with almost no notice. And another strike is organized for May 24th. Pope Francis and a constellation of religious and philosophical leaders have begun addressing climate change as a moral issue. And people hear religious messages and moral issues through a different lens than they hear political messages. There's a filter that goes on on politics that the Pope and his fellows managed to transcend. More than 200 cities, states, and nations representing 1.3 billion people and nearly 40% of the global economy have pledged to reduce their emissions by 80 to 95% by 2050. I'm rather proud to say that my own state, Washington, just this week, passed the most comprehensive energy, carbon, and utility reform legislation in the world. The solutions, thank you. A lot of hard work, and, and, and this is after our failing to pass two initiatives to do this, but we, we, we finally got the formula right. The Solutions Project has developed roadmaps showing how all 50 states and 143 nations can achieve 100% clean, Climate Action 100 Plus, a group of pension funds, insurance companies, foundations, and other institutional investors 
with more than $32 trillion under management, are pressuring the 100 largest companies with major carbon footprints to align their spending with whatever is needed to limit warming to no more than two degrees. We now have a campaign to try to push them to, of course, get it down to 1.5 degrees after the last IPCC report. Some companies, including Google, Ikea, and Mars, have pledged to achieve the 100% clean on a firm, swift timetable. Public health officials now routinely speak of climate change as a major health threat. Conservation biologists cite climate change as a principal driver of the epidemic of extinction that is sweeping the planet, more than a thousand times the background rate before the evolution of Homo sapiens. Following the cost reductions of wind and solar, the cost of battery storage has now fallen precipitously. After Tesla launched the automobile, the electric automobile revolution, virtually every car company in the world will now have electric cars available by the end of this year. Prices are plummeting, mileage is increasing, and charging times are shrinking. Personal cars, buses, and trucks are all on the cusp of a revolution. A, 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 a little, again, personal anecdote. I, I finally gathered together enough savings to put solar collectors on my roof. Um, I live in Seattle. <laughs> I mean, this, this is, but but it, it, it got to the point where I figured, okay, it's, 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 if I'm going to be preaching this stuff, I've got to do it regardless of the economics. Mm. If you have driven a Prius or anything that tells you on a moment-to-moment -moment basis what kind of mileage you're getting, you find yourself driving to that device. You, do the, you get one of those devices on your computer if you put solar modules on your roof. So we sized our modules to produce as much electricity in an average year as the house would use, but then we found ourselves doing what we could to drive it lower. Uh, I, I, I haven't used a clothes dryer in two years. We, of course, dry it on the line in the summer, but in the winter in Seattle, we have these clothes racks spread all over the house drying <laughs> stuff. Uh, we're just, it, it becomes a contest. How low can you go? And it turned out we had so much electricity that we bought a Chevy Bolt and met 100% of our electric requirements for the house and 100% of our electric requirements for the Bolt with solar collectors facing the wrong direction, facing east, not the south, because that's the only place that our roof In Seattle. Uh -huh. I mean, what's up, Phoenix? <laughs> And a similar opportunity lies in taking all green buildings to scale. I, I, I developed a building in Seattle that's six stories tall. As soon as I say it, this will be obvious. You have the same roof on a building if it's one story, if it's six stories, it's 50 stories. You just got the roof. So we've got a six story building, the only six story building in the world that is net energy positive. It's an all electric building from the sunshine that falls on its roof. Once again, this is Seattle. It's because we designed it to do that. It costs no more than a conventional building. But we don't have any granite countertops. We don't have any marble inside our elevators. I can't believe elevators with marble in them. So you're hauling an extra 2,000 pounds up and down every time you go. It's, it's a matter of being smart. And we, we were smart. We designed it to drive down. And, and candidly, the big thing in it is we don't, we don't have a garage. We don't have a garage for automobiles. We have only a garage for bicycles, for major public transportation. It's all a matter of priorities. OK, I have been told that I need to pull this together rapidly. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do so. Let me, let me punch through what I can. You know, when, when I was in college, I took a course in speech where I was told somewhere in every set of remarks, you have to utter the words, and in conclusion, <laughs> if only to give the audience hope. <laughs> um, Earth Day 2020, the 50th anniversary, is going to be a spectacular thing. Let me reduce this to a series of sentences. We're sending out regional organizers to every major city that we can work in, in the nation and the world, to start putting together events. We're going to be enlisting the next generation of activists with social media platforms, uh, on Earth Day this year, we announced a year-long uh, partnership with Twitter, uh, and we're going to be trying to get into Pinterest and Instagram and Tumblr and WeChat and Weibo and Facebook and RenRen and YouTube and a bunch of other things that haven't even been invented yet. We, the, the gap between the fabulously wealthy and the destitute has never been greater here and in most of the world, and an every revolution can either increase that gap 
or largely eliminated. We've got to do it right, which is why the people in this audience are of such special importance. The poor communities were not deeply involved, certainly not the national organizations in that first Earth Day. We got some good things out of it for such communities, but it was, it was a byproduct. This time, as with the Green New Deal, it has to be right smack at the core. We're going to work with national and state education associations to get climate <coughs> programming focused on solutions into every school in the nation. Uh, Social movements are always powered by the young. We're going to try to enlist the old. There's a whole bunch of activists like me from the 1960s who uh, now will have a little bit of time on our hands, have the same values, feel a little bit guilty at how little we've accomplished on climate. And uh, we, we would love to have a, a gray-green alliance built up. Um, we're working with partners to get climate solutions into museums, libraries, zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens, and athletic venues, and, and on and on. But in conclusion, <laughs> in 2018, the United States experienced 14 climate-related disasters with losses of more than a billion dollars each. Last month, the Midwestern breadbasket experienced two calamitous floods, one right on top of the other, leading to the ruination of hundreds of farmers who'd been on the land for generations. The wildfire season is about to begin. It will be followed by the hurricane season. Although President Trump has taken a wrecking ball to international climate treaties uh, because he scoffs at voluminous peer-reviewed science, he's appointed the two worst EPA administrators in history and pledged to resurrect a dead coal industry, I'm confident that if we get ourselves together, his days are limited. He will not just be defeated, he will be crushed in the 2020 election. Because America has the ability to turn around on a dime. It most recently happened on gay marriage. You probably know Barack Obama campaigned against gay marriage, felt he had to in his first presidential drive. Five years later, it was ruled by the Supreme Court as being constitutionally protected in all five, in all 50 states. I mean, we can turn around rapidly. Uh, if we are successful in decarbonizing the global economy, it will produce the most comprehensive restructuring of the social order since the Industrial Revolution. And that's why so very many of the power brokers in the world, including the petrostates and Russia, are out to crush it. The only power base that we have is an aroused population. So I want you all, if you will, to please think of Earth Day 2020 not as an event, not as a day, but as a year-long campaign. To steal a line from Hamilton, it is not a moment, it's a movement. And whatever skills, contacts, resources, jobs, passions you may have, please throw them all into this movement for a just, equitable, healthy, prosperous, sustainable future. We are very close to having closed the last window to avoid pushing past 1.5 degrees where all sorts of unchangeable permanent catastrophes begin to become unavoidable. Uh, if we have four more years of this administration here, leading the tone that it is set for the rest of the planet, we will have missed that window. So, please, don't let it happen. Thank you.